I I often wonder because I'm a giant nerd what people like mm-hmm. Van Buren would think of the modern process, particularly mm-hmm. the 2016 election. That's Washington Post politics reporter Chris Eliza. And why does he wonder what Martin Van Buren would think of the American political machine and party system today? Well, because Martin Van Buren basically created the beast. I'm Lillian Cunningham, and this is the eighth episode of Presidential. Shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. What your country can do for you. A date which will live in infamy. Here are the presidential vital stats for Martin Van Buren. He's born in Kinderhook, New York in 1782, and his family is Dutch. He's actually the only president we've had in all of American history so far who spoke English as his second language. He comes from a modest family. His father owns a farm and a tavern. Taverns at the time, though, were the main places that people would gather to talk politics. So he's exposed to politics from a very early age and gets involved at the local level. Van Buren works his way up the political ranks, from the local level to the state level to the national level. He eventually becomes the main strategist for Andrew Jackson's successful presidential run in 1828. And by Jackson's second term, Martin Van Buren is appointed vice president. When Jackson's time in office is up, Van Buren goes from being vice president to being elected president himself in 1836. But he serves one term, and it's a term that's not considered great, and he's not elected a second time. Do people in, like, politics circles think about Martin Van Buren today? Or he's he's really just like off no. the radar for everyone. I, I would uh Lillian, I'd love to say yes, we we, we, <laughs> we have a weekly Van over, Buren uh, <laughs> uh reading of various pieces that he's written over his time in office, but the answer to that is no. Um I have a uh, a, a monthly trivia a night mm-hmm. called Politics and Pints in in Washington right by Capitol Hill. And Van Buren comes up uh once every three or four months because he uh, has several distinctions. First, non-British subject, uh, only president to not speak English in the home and the shortest, you know, mm-hmm. shortest of the president. So he, to the extent he's mentioned, <laughs> it's as an answer to a trivia question to try to stump people. Um, but no, I, I don't really think so. Um I feel like he's in the interregnum between the sort of founding fathers and then, you know, as you move into the Lincolns of the world. It's so it's so hard. It's like, you know, the the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. That's sort of how Van Buren is treated by history. It's like he wasn't a terrible president. He wasn't a good president. He was an okay president, which is sort of the most (laughs) damning judgment I think you can have. So his presidency is not great, but he does have a lasting impact on American politics. And that is as the father of the modern political machine and the central creator of the idea of national party politics. So what do we mean by all that? Well, here's Barbara Baer from the Library of Congress to start explaining. Van Buren can really be credited with having developed the modern political party system and a new way that presidents were elected to office. He's often called the father of the two-party system um, and was definitely one of the major founders of the Democratic Party. Also, he introduced you know, modern systems of party politics, uh, the, the political caucus, um, nominating conventions, and um, the system of patronage, which Andrew Jackson would use in office, and so would Martin Van Buren. One lesson from Van Buren is how do you build a power base? He was a master of manipulating the electoral college and winning elections by what you do at the local level, um, how you have voting in districts and so on. And in that way, he was a political magician that is the forefather to our very this very statistical way that we engineer political campaigns today. Okay, so how does all this come about? 
Well, remember how the 1824 election was crazy? (laughs) This was where there were four candidates, all technically of the same party, and they split the vote. They're basically divided along geographic lines. John Quincy Adams is from New England. William H. Crawford is from Georgia. Henry Clay is from Kentucky. Andrew Jackson is from Tennessee. And because the race is so tight, the decision ends up going to the House of Representatives, and they elect John Quincy Adams. But this starts a huge uproar. Van Buren is a senator at the time who's part of the same party, and he realizes that having all these multiple candidates with different geographic allegiances has created a political mess. It's causing candidates who are supposed to be on the same side to fight over their sectional issues like slavery. Now remember that Van Buren, as we said, hailed from the world of New York politics. And there he had headed up the Albany Regency, which was one of the first American political machines. It was basically a group of politicians in upstate New York who pulled the strings on local politics. So now that Van Buren's in Congress and seeing firsthand the mess of the presidential election of 1824, he starts thinking about how to replicate the party organization techniques they used in New York, but on a national level. So you don't have candidates from within the same party devouring each other. I spoke with Mark Cheatham, who's a professor at Cumberland University, and who's also organizing a huge project to go through and then digitize and make available all of Martin Van Buren's papers. That's what happens in 1824, is that you have the National Republicans who have four candidates who emerge from within that one party who start to eat each other and to divide the party. Uh, During the mid-1820s, Van Buren, uh, based on his experience in New York politics, uh, came to the conclusion that forming a national party and a national party system would actually be beneficial to helping tamp down the sectionalism that was emerging in the United States. Uh, There's a very famous letter that he writes to Richmond, Virginia, uh, newspaper editor Thomas A. Ritchie, in 1827 in which Van Buren lays out uh, his idea for creating this two-party system and essentially what he says is that he wants to create a party uh, as he puts it between the planters of the south and the plain republicans of the north and he goes on to explain to Ritchie that the reason for this is that because of slavery and because of the sectionalism that was already um, expressing itself that having national parties would would help to bind Americans together and would help avoid that that issue of sectionalism. So I think that's one of the important lessons uh, is that Van Buren has a vision about national parties that that he sees could help keep slavery from becoming an issue that could drive us apart. When Van Buren has this vision for a national party that would bind northern and southern voters, part of what it entails is that he thinks you need mechanisms for creating that support across the country for a single candidate. This means having nominating conventions, as Barbara mentioned, which we still have today. So before the mid-1820s, what was happening was that groups of congressmen had essentially decided which candidates should run. So part of what Van Buren does is push the idea that voters should be involved in this part of the process. They should get to help narrow down the field of candidates within a party by nominating a main candidate. This vision of his helped democratize the political process. And at least in theory, it helped voters from the same party, but from different regions, agree to ultimately support a single candidate. And this is really still the concept behind the Democratic and Republican conventions that we have even in an election year like this. One of the other things that Van Buren does um, effectively between 24 and 28 is he starts to envision how can he take what he learned in New York state politics in terms of party organization and translate that on the national level. So starting at the grassroots level, having politicians and party leaders there organize voters, and then having a next level at, say, the county level, you have politicians who um, help keep voters in line and then at the state level, and then eventually at the national level. And this is something that takes time to come to fruition, but it's a way that we think about politics today, and frankly, it's the way that political parties are structured, is that you have a national party, uh, and at this point, we have national party chairs, 
who then try to work from the top down to convince party members to support whomever the candidate is going to be for the presidency and for congressional seats and, and otherwise. And so that's a vision that Van Buren gives to U.S. politics that I think is still extremely important today. So Van Buren is putting all of this into effect following that vicious, messy 1824 campaign. What he's doing is starting to build up a political engine for Andrew Jackson to run again in 1828. What Van Buren comes to understand between 24 and 28 is that he needs a candidate um, who he can put forward to excite voters. And so Andrew Jackson is that person. And what Andrew Jackson realizes and the people in Tennessee who surround Jackson, what they realize is they need that national coalition that Van Buren can offer. And thus, the Democratic Party is born. Though it's worth keeping in mind that the platforms have changed over time, so the Democratic Party then doesn't really correspond to the party of today. I'm going to let Chris Saliza explain what's similar and different about the Democratic Party of yore. (laughs) The animating belief that Van Buren had, certainly, of the power of the average person, their need to play a role, their need to be listened to, their need to be fought for. Democrats would certainly lay claim to that today. If you watch a Hillary Clinton or a Bernie Sanders speech, you will see them say, we understand what it is to struggle. We understand what it is to not be able to achieve your dreams. And we are looking out for you more so than the Republican Party. Full stop, that is a strain that runs through Mm -hmm. um, all of those years. What doesn't run through as much was Van Buren, if he had to describe himself, would probably call call himself a fan of limited government, Mm -hmm. uh, which is something that is very common. You will hear a hundred times in a single Republican presidential debate these days. So um, there are similarities, certainly, but, but what Van Buren would define in terms of the ideals or founding principles of the Democratic Party are not a fully overlapping concentric circle of what they are today. And so in creating the Democratic Party itself, Van Buren really established the framework that has underpinned modern American politics. And that's the idea that we have two big national parties, Democrats and Republicans, that each try to be as strong and unified as they can so they can defeat each other rather than fighting within their own ranks. Over time, this idea of we can't eat our own continues to be up all the time. You're hearing it uh, even now as, you know, it looks as though Hillary Clinton is going to take a significant lead over the next month or so in terms of delegates over Bernie Sanders. You're already hearing talk of he needs to get out sooner rather than later because he's hurting the party more broadly. Now, the pushback is, well, healthy debate on the issues um, is not hurting the party. It is, in fact, making the party more healthy. So it's a very fine line. Van Buren was clearly right about the idea that you cannot run four people with relatively similar views and split the, the vote four ways and then allow one person who has divergent views a unified vote, you will lose. Well, it seems like um, there's a lot to think about in terms of Van Buren today when you look at the Republican race <laughs> too, right? And this I, idea that in many ways the sort of machine doesn't seem to quite be working. Yeah, right? my, my guess is Van Buren, though, a smart and... and a guy with considerable foresight did not imagine uh, the impact of Twitter on the modern campaign. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's possible. I don't want to say probable, but it's possible that you are seeing the dying out of machine slash establishment politics in this election. Now, the truth of the matter is machine politics have been fading for years and years and years. They, they still exist in a few very ethnic major cities in this country. Boston and Chicago are, are the two best examples. But, you know, there used to be a uh, Frankfurt, Kentucky machine mm. and a Boise, Idaho. You know, there was a guy, right. typically a uh-huh. white male, who controlled these things. And 
the age of the internet, the revolt within the Republican Party in terms of the Tea Party, th- these things have all weakened that idea that, that, that there is a back room laying on of hands and then that person winds up being the person. Uh, certainly Trump's uh, willingness to thumb his nose at everything that Van Buren built in terms of the need for an organization, the need to play by sort of a set of rules, the need to at some level play nice with each other because you're all on the same team at the end of the day. Um, These are things that Trump not only doesn't ascribe to, but has made (laughs) not ascribing to them a remarkably successful political brand. Um, You know, look at the, the establishment candidate in the Republican presidential race was Jeb Bush, right? This is someone whose father and brother were president of the United States. This is someone who raised $150 million through a super PAC in the first six months of 2015. This is a person who 100 years ago, 200 years ago, would have been the, that 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. frankly, would have been the Republican presidential nominee. I do think it speaks to the the declining power of, and I don't want to make establishment machine and sort of back room all synonymous, but the idea that there's a group of people who uh, are able to tap you on the the shoulder with a sword and and say, say you're the guy. Oh, and or also get say in to line. voters, Absol- get in line. Absolutely. This is, this and that, is who you have to that, support. Exactly. That was the great gift that Van Buren had, which was at the time, you needed that touch on the shoulder. You needed the money that provided, the organization that provided. It was sort of like, this is the candidate, get in line, you will vote for him. What do you think is an important question that we can be asking ourselves from taking the time to look back at him and what he's done for the country and left the country? Well, I mean, I do think the thing that he has left, and I'm not sure he even thought it would grow to what it has grown into, is this idea of party unity, the need to be united, the need to sort of speak as one voice, the power of machine politics, of establishment politics. Um, I don't think there's any bigger storyline in the 2016 election, and, and we focus on Trump, and, and rightly so, but look, Bernie Sanders' challenge to Hillary Clinton uh, is also meaningful in this regard, of the decline and fall of the two party establishments. I think it is more rapid on the Republican side. Hillary Clinton remains a favorite and, and for the nomination and is quite clearly an establishment candidate. But um, this idea that he sort of helped codify that if we unite together, we have considerable power to put the sorts of people we want in office in office doesn't feel relevant in this presidential election. And uh, Social media, celebrity, the fusion of reality culture and political culture um, have made it possible for uh, the establishment to really fade, erode and, and be grasping for relevance at this point. You know, is that era ended after literally a 185 year run? That to me is, I think, the most relevant thing uh, about Van Buren and his insights to, to where we are politically today. Van Buren's success orchestrating Jackson's campaign, his loyalty, and his ability to maneuver end up meaning that his political star is on the rise once Jackson is elected president in 1828. By Jackson's second term in office, he brings on Van Buren as his vice president. And just to give a little bit more background about Van Buren, his wife has died by this point and he has four sons. He never remarries. He's known for being something of a dandy. That's the word that keeps coming up about him, dandy. (laughs) He wears green velvet suits with yellow shirts. That's one example of his dandy ways. And and it turns out that he ended up dressing in this sort of high fashion way pretty early in his career because he got feedback while practicing law that he needed to come off as more sophisticated and from less of a modest background. Those of you who've listened to other episodes know that I typically ask historians on the podcast to describe what it would be like to go on a blind date with that president. And, I mean, I do that just as a way of getting a better sense of their personality. Well, you may also have noticed I haven't run that question in this episode, 
And that's because Mark and Barbara both gave me similar answers that it's really hard to get a sense of Martin Van Buren beyond just, you know, kind of the joke about the green suits. I think it's hard to see into the heart of Martin Van Buren that, you know, he seems to be a pragmatist, um, the deal maker. Uh, you know, what is the expedient thing? His personality is hard to peg. Um, biographers who've studied Van Buren talk about him, in his letters at least, being very closed. Uh, it's hard to get a real sense of um, who, who he is and what he's thinking in terms of his, his inner world. Do we get any sense of what's driving him as he moves up the political ladder? especially as he orchestrates Jackson's campaign and then becomes vice president during Jackson's second term? Certainly, uh, he is someone who enjoys politics. He enjoys the intrigue. He enjoys, um, you know, the, 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 the thrill of victory and trying to figure out when he, when he loses, which isn't that often early in his career, you know, how to overcome that. So I think that's part of it, you know, his personal ambition um, I think with all politicians, no matter what they say, all politicians want some form of power. And I think Van Buren um, wants that. And I think he wants that because he does have a vision. And the other interesting thing about Van Buren is that because he doesn't come from wealth, um, I think he sees, I think, I think he possesses a, an ambition that you oftentimes find in politicians of this era or any era, um, those who want to be successful and who frankly work very hard at it. The Little Magician nickname um, comes from his ability to uh, make things happen politically behind the scenes. It is something that later will become a negative um, nickname because people see him as manipulating uh, Andrew Jackson in particular. And what comes about as, as a result of his loyalty to Jackson is that Jackson replaces John C. Calhoun on the 1832 ticket and Van Buren becomes vice president in 1832. And there are people at the time, and even since then, who look at that and say, yep, that's the little magician uh, pulling his tricks. Um, I don't think Van Buren is that calculating, but certainly he probably realized that uh, being on Jackson's good side was only going to help him in the future. His skill as a political operator pays off, both for the party and for him personally. Not only does it make him vice president, But when Jackson's two terms are over, Jackson goes out and supports Van Buren's run for the presidency, and Van Buren pretty easily wins. And yet, to a great extent, those traits that got Van Buren all the way up the ladder don't serve him as president, and we've seen this before with some of our earlier presidents as well. In Van Buren's case, this is partly because he doesn't have the out-front charisma that the office seems to require. Uh, he comes into office after Andrew Jackson, who's a big personality and has you know, very decisive opinions about things. And Van Buren seems to almost wilt uh, in the spotlight. And I think that says something about political leadership. There are some people who can lead in the background. There are people who can sort of move behind the scenes and make things happen. Uh, once you put them at the forefront of things, however, uh, that's not such an easy task to accomplish, and I think we see that with Van Buren when he's president. That was Mark Cheatham, and here's Barbara Bayer from the Library of Congress. Andrew Jackson was a giant personality, very charismatic, and Martin Van Buren was literally a smaller man and didn't have the same kind of people skills, which seems a little remarkable given what he had accomplished in the state of New York. Uh, He was a very, very good behind the scenes person, uh, a political mechanic who could wield compromises, get people to do things that needed to be done, uh, make deals, Uh, but he was not a strong leader in the way that Jackson had been. Um, He also had very, very bad luck. So sometimes we have presidents who do everything right to prepare to be president. Van Buren, had been a member of Congress. He had was very briefly the governor of New York, very, very briefly. Um, then he had been in the cabinet. He'd been the vice president. If anybody was 
prepared to be president, it was Martin Van Buren. But when he's actually faced with the presidency, basically all the dirt hit the fan from the Jackson administration, including the fact that in 1837 there was a major economic depression. I think of him in some ways like Lyndon Baines Johnson, that Johnson too had been so prepared to be president, and then he was faced with certain crises in the presidency that deflected from what he had hoped he would be doing as the president. And so that was true for Van Buren too. Van Buren may have been dealt a bad hand by some of Jackson's decisions, but Van Buren was also not willing to compromise the party line to play a better hand. As president, he's in many ways still acting like a party strategist. He's not a very effective president, and part of the reason for that is because he's not able to free himself and adapt and be flexible in a way that we expect presidents to be. He tries to keep the party together by focusing on small government, uh, by focusing on um, limited government intervention in the depression that struck in 1837. So one of, the, one of his failings, I think, is that he doesn't respond to the times. He's still focused on how do I keep the party together and help them support what I see as the vision for the United States. And he doesn't seem cognizant of the fact that voters don't support some of his ideas. Um, they want immediate relief. They want something that will help um, you know, give them jobs or, or you know, give them food on their table. And Van Buren doesn't seem to respond to that. So there's the one part of his leadership failing as president that's about charisma. But there's also this other part that's about the fact that he's still thinking in the same way that animated him as a political operator. What's the party line? How do I make sure we adhere to it? A president, though, needs more nuance and flexibility than that to succeed. Here's Chris Eliza. Orthodoxy is a great thing if you are running a national party. If you see either of the national party chairs, Republican or Democrat at this point, they will parrot the party line in every circumstance possible because that's their job. Uh, When you get elected president, orthodoxy only gets you so far. Uh, The truth of the matter is, both within your own party and as it relates to the other party, someone who is a sort of predictable adherent of party principle at all times isn't going to get anything done. People don't think of themselves, regular people don't think of themselves as Democrat or Republican. They just they live Mm -hmm. and sort of they adhere to whatever principles make sense to them. They don't see everything through a partisan lens. Uh, As I was thinking about it, Bill Clinton comes to mind. He went on to, and I guess you could, this is either a good or a bad thing depending on how you view the world, but went on to popularize the idea of triangulation, which is use your own party's orthodoxies, which in the House and Senate the members of the House and Senate in your party tend to adhere to more strongly. They have to. Mm-hmm. They're more functionaries of the party than the president is. Use them as an example of what you're not doing in order to present yourself as a moderate, middle-of-the-road deal maker. Well, many in my party say fill-in-the-blank, but I don't agree <laughs> with fill-in-the-blank. Uh, say what you will about Bill Clinton's presidency. He was able to accomplish things Um, using an approach to that because I think he understood what Van Buren was either not able to understand or not able to execute, which is orthodoxy is all well and good up to a point. And that point, I think, is the presidency, at which point, sure, you have a, a D or an R after your name, certainly, but you are the president of the entire country. And to get things done... Um, you have to act like it. There's a big difference between being the chairman or chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee and being president of the United States. Their approaches are very different and their results are very different. But Van Buren didn't seem to quite get that. And so he is still acting as the political party operator. And he kind of just dutifully keeps to the Jacksonian agenda. One of those agendas was Indian removal. So we often disparage Andrew Jackson for his genocide towards Indians and particularly for the Trail of Tears. 
but the Trail of Tears actually happened under Van Buren's presidency, not under Andrew Jackson. And they basically were death marches that started in May of 1838, and people died of disease and overcrowding of hunger, and many people died in either very hot or very cold weather of exposure. Ultimately, about a quarter of the people that were moved um, on what became known as the Trail of Tears died, were about 4,000 Cherokees. So it's a terrible and tragic thing. And it wasn't just the Cherokees. And Van Buren's spin on it in this annual address at the end of that very year where this had all happened in 1838. This is one of the documents that we have um, in our Van Buren collection here at the Library of Congress. He talks about many issues. It's a long address, so I'm just reading the part about Indians. It affords me sincere pleasure to be able to apprise you of the entire removal of the Cherokee Nation of Indians to their new homes west of the Mississippi. The measures authorized by Congress at its last session with a view to the long-standing controversy with them have had the happiest effects by an agreement concluded with them by the commanding general in that country who has performed the duties assigned to him on the occasion with commendable energy and humanity their removal has been principally under the conduct of their own chiefs, and they have immigrated without any apparent reluctance. And he goes on for quite a while about the history of Indian policy, and he's clearly positioning himself that, again, he's just a political operator who's carrying out long-term policy that had been formed by every president of the United States before him. Um, so you don't hear remorse. You don't. You you get a very um, happy gloss on the trail of tears. It's almost remarkable that he could have made this kind of speech. To me, you know, Van Buren failed as a president in a couple key instances, and Cherokee removal in 1838 is one of them. And the other one was also racially based, um, and. That was the Amistad case. We talked about the Amistad case in our John Quincy Adams episode. This was where Africans staged a mutiny aboard the slave ship Amistad. Well, this happens while Van Buren is in office, and the case goes to the Supreme Court, and it's pretty clear that Van Buren sides with the idea that they should be found guilty and denied their freedom. I think it's another instance where he's maintaining the status quo. He's maintaining slavery. He's maintaining uh, Indian removal. He maintains the policies of Jackson on the bank. But in his viewpoint, this was what was best for the United States. On at least some of these issues, particularly the economic crisis, the American public doesn't really agree with his approach. And Van Buren fails to get himself reelected for a second term as president. Despite all this, this political organization that he does uh, during the 1820s to form the Democratic Party, in the 1840 election, he doesn't really take advantage of that. Uh, his opponent, William Henry Harrison, goes out and gives speeches um, that Whigs use all kinds of popular electioneering techniques like distributing alcohol and having rallies and you know, uh, for, uh, uh, writing political songs and singing them at rallies. And Van Buren is very passive during that election. And uh, to me, that's one of the conundrums about him. What is he thinking? I mean, he is the one who really laid the groundwork for this type of popular campaigning, yet he doesn't involve himself in it in 1840. And that's one of those unresolved questions. Part of why historians don't quite have the answer to that is that Van Buren purposefully destroyed many of his personal letters during his lifetime. And to this day, no one knows why. Uh, you know, the question is, why does he do that? And, you know, that's what historians love, is that mystery. Why does he do it? Interestingly, too, after losing the election, Van Buren does run again in 1844, and he finally starts to express views that don't quite adhere to the Democratic Party line. Most notably, he's against the idea of immediately bringing Texas into the Union because it's a slave state, or it would be a slave state. 
The difference of opinion between Van Buren and Jackson on this issue of slavery is what causes Jackson to give his support for the Democratic nomination to James Polk instead of Van Buren in 1844. This is despite Van Buren's longtime loyalty to Jackson. By 1848, Van Buren's anti-slavery views have grown stronger, and in a twist that you probably didn't see coming, he leaves the Democratic Party that he did so much to create. He launches one more unsuccessful bid for the presidency, and he represents a splinter group called the Free Soil Party. This is the exact type of splintering that he has worked for all of his career leading up to this to prevent. But from that vantage point outside the Democratic Party, he gets a real view of the strength of the machine he created. His splinter group is far from powerful enough to win against that party establishment. And so without the machine's support, Van Buren's political career is essentially over. And with that, the little magician disappears from the political stage. Special thanks to this week's guests, Barbara Baer, Mark Cheatham, and Chris Eliza. Music for the podcast is by Dave Westner. You know how Chris mentioned at the beginning of the episode how he hosts a politics trivia night? Well, if you live in the D.C. area, or you'll be visiting here soon... The next Politics and Pints event is coming up on March 14th. You can put all this presidential history you've been learning in the podcast to use. Thanks for listening, and also for all the amazing and kind emails and comments that so many of you have been sharing with me about the podcast. As always, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at presidential underscore WP, and you can subscribe for free to the podcast on iTunes. Next week is an episode that I've been getting many questions about. It's William Henry Harrison's week. He's the president who dies after only a month in office. Will that episode be only two minutes long, as some of you have wondered? Listen next week to find out. <laughs>